Good evening. I'm David Lee, and I'm the provost here at WKU, and I am also a historian, and I have apparently gotten the mic to work. So I am probably at the outside edge of my technical skills, so I, I want to congratulate myself on that. On behalf of the university, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here this evening. We're delighted to have the 33rd Conference on Topology and its Applications meeting, uh, meeting here on our campus. I'd like to add a particular word of greeting to our international visitors here this morning, or this evening. Uh, all of us here on this campus and in Bowling Green and Warren County in Kentucky are especially delighted to have you all with us. I hope all of you are enjoying your stay here in Bowling Green, and I'm especially happy to welcome you to WKU's newest building, Ogden College Hall, which houses much of our, our science program. I know that Dean Stevens encouraged you all to take a walk around at some point during your visit here, so please be sure to do that. She is rightly very proud of this building, and it's got some nice science features built into it, and I think you'll enjoy a chance to kind of walk around and get, get a little acquainted with, uh, with the newest building here on, the, on this campus. Hosting conferences like, like yours is a particular honor for us, and we're really delighted that you've chosen WKU for your meeting. It's exciting to have so many outstanding scholars, kind of our own sort of all-star game, visiting here on our, our campus. Conferences like this one don't simply fall from the sky, obviously. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our, our local organizers, Klaus Ernst and Sanju Gupta and Tom Richmond, all of whom have put a good bit of time and effort into making sure this conference was a success. You've probably applauded them once already, maybe even more than that, but I'd like to ask you to applaud them again. <laughs> and something that I, I, I really do want to congratulate you on, connections with the community are very important to a university like WKU. So I really want to thank the planners of this conference and all of you who are participating for scheduling a public lecture as part of this meeting. I, I just think that's a wonderful addition to any academic conference, and particularly for one on this campus at this time, that's a wonderful part of the, a part of the program. It's a special honor, of course, to have a Nobel laureate, J. Michael Kosterlitz, on our campus. And to introduce Professor Kosterlitz, I'd like to welcome Dr. Arvada Saxena, from the Los Alamos National Lab. Thank you, Provost Lee. Good evening. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. J. Michael Kostelitz. Professor Kostelitz is Harrison E. Fonsworth Professor at University of Physics of Brown University since 1982. Professor Kostelitz received his BA and MA both at University of Cambridge. After that, he received his DPhil from Oxford University. Subsequently, he was a postdoc at University of Birmingham, and after that, he was a postdoc at uh, Cornell University. When he was at University of Birmingham, he worked with David Thaulas, and that's when he did his best and most seminal work. It's called Kostelitz Thaulas trans Transition, and since then, it has become part of the scientific vernacular called KT Transition. Uh, this was about topological defects, and this conference is about topological defects. The work involved unbinding of certain topological defects called vortex, uh, anti-vortex pairs. Now, after that, since 1982, uh, Professor Kostelis has been at Brown University. He has received several awards. Uh, first, he received the Maxwell Medal from the British Institute of Physics. He received the last Onsager Prize from the American Physical Society. After that, he was elected as a member of National uh, Academy of Sciences. And in 19, uh, 2016, uh, he shared the Nobel Prize with David Thaulas and Duncan Haldane. Now, when he is doing science, he is using scalars, vectors, and tensors. But when he is not doing science, he himself is a scalar. He's a mountain climber. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Kostelis.
Okay, let's hope this thing works. I'm a bit technically challenged with all these this modern um, technology, and so um, now I'm very, very honoured to be here talking to this this audience, and um, so the title of my talk is topological defects and phase transitions in two dimensions, but um, since it's so difficult, I find it so difficult to, to make up these PowerPoint slides. All these slides are actually dual purpose slides. So there's a, sub, there's a, a subtitle um, to this talk, uh, so, which is a random walk through physics to a Nobel Prize. And that's really what I'll talk about. I'm not going to talk much about the physics because probably half the audience hasn't a clue about physics and couldn't, didn't, doesn't, don't, couldn't care less about physics. And so I thought I'd, I'd tell you about the story about how I got to, um, to, 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 to Stockholm, where I was, see now, if I can get this thing to work. Ah, yeah, just to prove that I was actually there, <laughs> here's, a you, here's a photograph of uh, me and my wife in the middle, and uh, there's the King of Sweden, Queen of Sweden, the Crown Princess of Sweden, uh, her husband, and, the young, and to the uh, left are the two younger princesses. Now, so, success. Now, just to prove that I was actually once a child, <laughs> ma many, ma uh, not a large number of years ago, um, this is a picture of my father, um, and me, as a, as a young child, outside our granite house in Cults Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. Um, now, uh, yeah. now, I was born in Aberdeen, Scotland in 1943. My parents were German. My father came from an, a non-practicing Jewish family, and my mother came from a right-wing Aryan family which at the time, uh, we're talking about, uh, about the early 30s, my father worked at the Charité Hospital in Berlin, and in 1932, Hitler permitted him to work, but not to be paid. So at this point, my father realized that things were not good in, uh, for a Jew in, in Germany, so he used his contacts in Britain and looked for a job there. He was offered Various, various temporary jobs at several places, but Aberdeen University offered him a permanent um, job, which he accepted. Because there were two reasons why Aberdeen was very attractive, despite the climate there. Um, the first was the security of a permanent post, and also um, was the presence of a Nobel laureate called uh, McLeod, who my father wanted to work with. Unfortunately, McLeod had the bad grace um, to drop dead shortly after my father's arrival, so my father had to make his own presence felt, and he worked there for 60 years. 60, yeah, about 60 years, finally quitting at age 90, when old age took over. My mother followed my father from Germany to Scotland, and they married in Glasgow in 1934, and settled in a small house in a village about four miles from the center of Aberdeen, where I grew up. Now, I went to school in Aberdeen at a semi-private boys' school called Robert Gordon College, where I received, uh, I think, a very good education. Um, it was nice because I could give up the subjects I disliked when I was 16 and concentrate on the ones I liked and was good at. Fortunately, uh, my parents never overtly uh, tried to influence my choice of study, and I naturally gravitated towards maths and science sciences because I basically disliked all the humanities, literature, languages, fine arts, etc. I think that this is because of my lousy memory. I like to say that I can remember a maximum of 10 facts, but I'm not too sure about the last four. So, and all the humanity subjects are very memory intensive. 
as I'm sure that you, all, you all know, and I always struggled with these. Mathematics and sciences, on the other hand, I found could be handled with minimal memory and extensive use of logical deduction, which suited my way of fun functioning. Now, my education was a bit torturous. As, I'm, as I mentioned, I went to school from age four to 16 at Robert Gordon's College in Aberdeen, and then my father decided that perhaps I was good enough that uh, for Cambridge University. So I was sent to Edinburgh Academy where the teaching went up to English A and S levels as needed for the best English universities. I got through this uh, easily, again getting top grades, and was accepted at Cambridge with a prestigious um, bursary or scholarship to study natural sciences, which, to my great pleasure, did not include any other subjects. Initially, I got a bit bored with the teaching because I'd learned almost all of it at my Edinburgh school. However, the chemistry was fun. But I got turned off by an incident where a test tube of colorless fluid I was staring at started to change color. I held, held it out at arm's length to the side when it exploded and sent shards of glass into my cheek. To this day, I have no idea what, what, what happened. There were one or two other incidents during which I discovered that I'm actually red-green blind, which makes distinguishing test tubes with different shades of reddish liquids somewhat difficult and sometimes dangerous. As an aside, uh, not to mention, um, I have problems with dif distant traffic lights. However, I seem to have got away with it so far. Now, these difficulties, together with my poor memory, made me decide to go for the simpler but safer subject of physics as my concentration. But my academic Cambridge career also got disrupted when I joined the Cambridge University Climbing Club. Now, this club ran a bus uh, up to um, Derbyshire, uh, the Derbyshire Gridstone or North Wales or the, or the Lake District. I was introduced to the sport of rock climbing and found that I was quite good at that as well and I quickly became addicted to it. Now, there's nothing to compare with the rush one gets when you, you step out onto a steep cliff knowing that a mistake could have serious consequences up to and including death. It's amazing how this concentrates the mind. Now, the, the climbing became my main interest, followed by physics and my newly acquired Swedish girlfriend. Now, not, so, not surprisingly, I didn't do as well as expected in the final examinations um, because, of course, I'd been, uh, spent all my, all my spare, spare time climbing and rarely uh, had the energy to go to any, any classes. So I didn't do as well, as I said. I, so to try to make up, rescue my academic career, I completed a fourth year at Cambridge doing part three mathematics, or otherwise known as applied maths, to try to, um, but my climbing passion intervened again, and I did not perform as well as I'd hoped. I was turned down for graduate school in high energy theory uh, in the Department of Mathematical and Theoretical Physics um, at Cambridge. Ironically, I was offered a place as a graduate student with Sir Neville Mott to study solid state physics in the physics department, the field for which I would later win a Nobel Prize. However, I turned this down in favor of graduate school in Oxford in high energy theory, which at the time was the glamour subject in physics. Now, in Oxford, I worked on what are called dual resonance models, otherwise, called, otherwise known as the Veneziano model, of which you may or may not have heard, and published a couple of papers which have probably never been read. On completion of my DPhil in 1969, I was awarded a two-year Royal Society Fellowship 
to be used anywhere in Europe, as was my closest friend in Oxford. So, my girlfriend, Verit, who is now my wife for 47 years, actually it's probably 40, 40, 40, 48 years by now, um, I and the, and the other Oxford graduate students went to Torino University in Italy as postdocs. Now, personally, I chose Torino because of proximity to the mountains. But also, the physics was quite good in the persons of um, Sergio Fubini and Tulli Reggi. The three of us, the, you know, my, the other postdoc, my girlfriend and, my, and myself, rented an apartment, um, shared an apartment, which made the ladies in the local milk shop very curious. They could never figure out which of the two males uh, Barrett belonged to. Of course, she belonged to neither, but this was 1969, after all, where uh, things were a little bit different. Now, I must say I had a wonderful year in Torino. My scholarship from the Royal Society was sufficiently generous that Barrett and I could eat very well and go skiing in Italy, France, and Switzerland every weekend in the winter. and also even for the occasional week in the winter. Of course, it did help that I had climbing friends renting apartments in, in, in Verbier and Lausanne in Switzerland where we could always sleep on the floor for a few nights, so we rarely had to pay for hotel rooms. Uh, now, let's see. I uh, should, should go through a few slides. Okay. Here we are. There's some... There's in the center of the, yeah, in the center is me, and to the left is a guy I used to go climbing a lot with called Mick Burke, and in the forefront is another very good British climber called Martin Boyce, and of course, uh, Martin and I are now, of course, long stopped climbing because we're far, we're far too old, and Mick, unfortunately, got killed on Everest in 1975. Now, I also managed to continue with uh, my rock climbing, and we did some, and did some climbs that actually weren't repeated for several years. I was this was all in Italy. I was introduced to the local young mountaineers from Fiat, the car company, a car factory, I should say, uh, and it was, a f it was a fun experience, as they were very good climbers, but did not understand a word, speak or understand a word of English. Communica now, communication is vital when one depends on each other. Um, you know, when you're hanging off a steep cliff, it's important to be able to communicate clearly. And so since they didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Italian, this uh, situation got a bit tense sometimes. My Italian improved dramatically as, as you understand, I, be, I became very motivated to learn it. In fact, last February, I returned to Torino to receive an honorary doctorate in physics and discovered that in that region of the Alps, I'm better known as a climber than as a Nobel laureate. In effect, I'm labeled as introducing, I quote, the new morning of Italian climbing. Now this, okay, so, Now, let, let me tell you a story. When the winter of, of skiing was over, I got a bit restless because I really needed to go climbing. And with my newfound climbing partners, I was in a car driving along a very narrow road up the Val d'Orco in northern Italy. Looking around, I thought I'd entered paradise because bo on both sides of the valley, there were square kilometers of unclimbed rock. Now, you must remember that I came from Britain, where cliff climbing was a well-developed sport, and almost every square foot um, of rock had been climbed. So 
unclimbed rock was at a premium and kept a closely guarded secret until the discoverer had climbed every route he or she could manage. To find such an expanse of virgin uh, untouched rock was unheard of. Uh, I was aching to set up as many routes as I could possibly manage with my Italian friends. As we drove up the valley, we passed a 20 foot high boulder with a thin crack splitting one of its gently overhanging faces. When I saw this, I yelled in my best Italian, stop the car. I jumped out, put on my climbing shoes, and managed to get up the, uh, the crack. You can see the little, see, you can actually see the little crack. Where's the laser pointer? Oh yeah. Going up this, the, this face of the boulder, goes up like that. And this, this, this boulder's about, what, 20 feet high? Um, just about the height um, at which one can, one can you know, risk climbing without any protection, uh, but just high enough to, so that you could get hurt if you fell off. Now, we visited this, you know, uh, hadn't been back in Italy for about 40 years, and we eventually visited the, the rock again. So I wanted to look at the, uh, visit the uh, sites of my, my misspent youth. Uh, things have changed a bit because this photograph was taken um, at the time when uh, the, the road was, re was being widened and, and, co and, co and covered in. So this structure on the left is actually the tunnel, the start of a tunnel uh, for the new road. And the road builders were going to blow, the, blow this rock up, um, you know, it's because it was in the way. But the, uh, the, 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 the climbing community in, 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 in the northwest Italy uh, gathered in force and kept on and argued that this rock was part of the heritage and, was, had, and should not be blown up. And so it's actually still there, as we, when, as we found. You have to actually, there's an uh, opening in the side of the road tunnel. You can stop there. There's a parking spot. And you can walk out and, and, and see the rock. I was quite surprised to find that it was still there. As a, now, this, this, this crack is now known as the Fessura Costulates. I didn't find it especially difficult, but my climbing partners just simply could not repeat it. As a matter of fact, it took about 10 years till it was repeated. But now, of course, the route has been climbed hundreds of times, and the, this rock has become a, is an important feature of the village of Cerasoli, which is just a, you know, a little bit higher up the valley. Uh, recently, um, Last February, um, I think it was a year past February, I was invited by the mayor of Cerasoli and the, and the regional climbing com community for a get together in the village. And I was feasted and made an on honorary citizen of the village of Cerasoli. I was also told to my, su to my surprise that because of me and my rock, the tourism of the village has been booming ever since, as climbers come from all over the world to try their luck at the crack, and I was thanked for that. It really felt like uh, getting the Nobel Prize again, but this time for rock climbing. <laughs> Let's see, oh yeah, there's a picture of some, of some guy um, three quarters of the way up the crack. It's actually, inter it's an interesting crack, it's an interesting problem. It's a bit like physics, you know, physics research, because you step out in the unknown and you are on your own with no, gui no, um, no, gui no guides and so on. And so it's all up, up to you yourself. Uh, and uh, the only difference between physics research and, and climbing like this is that 
in physics, you're unlikely to get hurt should you make a bad mistake. OK, so then this is a uh, picture of it uh, on a post that I found. OK, now. Now, back to, back to my path. My fellow postdocs and I wrote a single paper on the, the, the vertex function in dual resonance model, models, which were precursors, which was a precursor to modern string theory. And this um, uh, paper is apparently still quoted in the literature. Now, the obvious place to go off to Torino as a high energy postdoc was CERN in Geneva because of the physics and, for me, the mountains. So both my colleague and I sent an application to CERN. He was accepted, but in my usual disorganized fashion, my application was late. And I got the reply, all the desk space is gone. Um, uh, please apply again next year. Now, I now faced unemployment. But uh, Barrett, my girlfriend, just looked at me and muttering some very uncomplimentary epithets, walked all the way down to the uh, Torino railway station to buy an English newspaper which had academic job adverts in it. She returned with the newspapers and sat me down at the kitchen table and said, apply. So I did and found a couple of positions. I, now, I was offered these positions and accepted a three-year postdoc position in the Department of Mathematical Physics um, at Birmingham University and reluctantly signed the contract. Shortly afterwards, I got a letter from CERN saying that they'd changed their minds and had decided they would have two people per office instead of one, so I could go. I immediately said to Berit that I would renege on Birmingham and go to CERN to have fun in the mountains, which is what I wanted to do from the beginning. I fought and lost the battle with my wife and father, who were of the opinion that having signed the contract, I was committed to go to Birmingham, that large industrial city in the flat middle of England with no mountains in sight, <laughs> which was the last place I wished to be. However, Birmingham turned out to be quite a nice city to live in, after all, despite the terrible unemployment because of the closing of car factories. The university was good. The Cadbury Estate was a lovely place to bring up a family. And we made many friends. And the local Licky Hills became our favorite family outing spot. So my first real job was in the Department of Mathematical Physics at Birmingham University, first as a research fellow, then a lecturer, senior lecturer, and finally as a reader. Now, in hindsight, it turns out that professionally, Birmingham University was the best choice I could have made. Although, at first, it was hard to believe that was the case. In the first year or two, I continued my, lo my um, long, long high energy calculations. I was on track with writing up my results uh, two or three times, but was repeatedly thwarted by a group at Berkeley, which published first. You know, several times I finished long, tedious calculations, was just sitting down to write, write up the paper for publication, when the preprint, doing exactly what, I, what, I was, what I'd done, arrived on my desk, and so that was it. Now, As I mentioned, I was quite good, I was very, actually very good at rock climbing. So I started to consider very seriously giving up physics to become a professional mountaineer. Fortunately, Berit, then my girlfriend and now my wife of, uh, says here 47 years, but must be 48 years now, vetoed this idea. As an aside, a few years later, I came down with a nasty neurological condition, multiple sclerosis, which affected my balance and destroyed any climbing ambitions I had. 
I had to make do with my day job as a physicist and teacher, which does not need, need the same athletic ability as, as climbing mountains. Now, back to my story. I was very upset with this group from Berkeley. And I descended upon my colleagues asking if they had, had an interesting problem that I might look at. As luck had it, Professor David Thaulis had an interesting problem in condensed matter physics. He was interested in a class of problems, of unsolved problems, in two dimensions, such as the onset of superconductivity and superfluidity in thin, very thin films. I think the word topology also appeared somewhere. I found his ideas very difficult and challenging, but they started to make sense. And David was a hard taskmaster and an excellent mentor. Now, in fact, David Thalos was probably, uh, had, had probably one of the most brilliant minds uh, in physics in the world. I would put him on a level with uh, people like um, Richard Feynman, um, Julian Schwinger, and people of that, of, of that sort. Now, in fact, this was the place, Birmingham was the place where I learned what physics is truly, really about, working with one of the truly great minds in the field. Together, we solved one of the remaining puzzles and phase transitions in two dimensions, for which I got my quarter of the Nobel Prize. I, I realized that physics was something I could devote my life to. And David and I discussed the problem further and wrote up a couple of papers which solved a lo the long-standing problem of phase transitions in two dimensions. And at age 30, I did my most important work for which I sh received my shared Nobel Prize. The phrase that come, uh, now I got the Nobel Prize in 2016. The work we actually we did was done in the early 1970s. So it's quite a long period of time before, um, before I actually got the prize. And so the phrase that comes to mind in our case is better late than never. Now, despite what one reads in accounts of Nobel Prize winners' progress to the prize, my story is anything but that. I, mean, I like to think of my journey to Stockholm as a random walk through physics because my Nobel Prize was a combination of about 95% dumb luck and 5% smarts. I mean, the luck was being in the right place at the right time with the right people and doing the right problem. And really, there's no way that uh, that sort of thing can be arranged. That's where the luck comes in. The, the smarts is just the ability to do the necessary ar arithmetic. Many people could do that. Now, although it certainly did not seem so at the time, the right place was the Department of Mathematical Physics at Birmingham University. The right time was the early 1970s. And the right problem and people were David Thalus and the problem we, we solved. Now, so for, the, for, for those students in the audience who feel that their, um, their career is, is in jeopardy and they're, you know, they're wondering what on earth to do in the future, I hope this story gives some, some of you hope because my, my story is really one of you know, random events and ending up in random places doing doing jobs that I, doing physics that I really didn't want to do. <laughs> but there was definitely um, a light at the end of the tunnel. And so no matter how difficult the path you're on seems to be at the moment. Now, I'm sure you'd like to know a little bit about the physics involved. Or maybe you, maybe, maybe you don't, but anyway, that's, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> now, 
Okay, well, let's just leave it there. I was introduced <laughs> to a, I was introduced to a completely new field of physics when, on that fateful day, I walked into David Thaler's office in Birmingham, asking in desperation for if he had a problem that I could look at, as I was at a standstill with my own. Strangely enough, this uh, famous professor took pity on the ignorant postdoc and kindly said, yes, he did have a long-standing problem. He felt that it had never been looked at properly. Um, now, it was not in my field at all, but concerned, as I said, concerned phase transitions in classical systems in two dimensions. And for about 20 years, the physical community had taken as gospel um, Lev Landau's rules of phase transitions, which combined with the rigorous mathematical proof by people like Merman and Wagner um, Pierre Ho and Pierre Hornberg and said, said, which said that there's no phase, uh, the rigorous mathematical proof basically said there's no what is called long range order in two dimensions at any finite temperature. That's in certain two-dimensional systems. Now, David Thales, now when, so when combined with, this, with the uh, laws set, up, set out by Lev Landau, we said that, uh, that the so-called low temperature phase should have what is called long-range order. In other words, one side of the system knows what the other side is doing. And because so, so the information go, travels, you know, over over an, an obviously bit large system. And according to uh, the rules set down by Lev Landau, this required what is called long range order. Now, long range order is pretty simple. A, a magnetic system, for example, consists of lots of little microscopic magnets, which um, say at, at low temperatures, li all like to line up, pointing in the same direction. And if they do point in the same direction, this is called long-range order. And of course, these uh, um, systems are subject to thermal fluctuations due to the, 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 due to the, due to the thermal noise or the fact that it's finite temperature, which disorder tends to kick these little, little atomic magnets and make them point in any arbitrary direction. And so in the two dimensions, uh, this tendency uh, overcomes the, the tendency to line up. Now, Thaulus okay, so, was aware of some of the experimental work that had been done. And this is a this uh, slide here is the um, the, the, the results of, a, of, an, of an experiment by Chester Yang and Stevens published in 1972, which was about the time uh, I started working on this problem. And you see, the point is that this is a quite a simple idea. You have a, a, a crystal with, a, with a, some, and this crystal has some resonant frequency. And as you all know, the resonant frequency, as you increase the mass of the crystal, the resonant frequency drops. And so what the, what the experiment um, involved was simply absorbing a very thin layer of liquid helium on the surface of this crystal and looking at the change in the resonant frequency. Now, this film is really thin, probably maybe two, three, four atomic layers thick. And you would certainly expect that this stuff, this fluid, would be stuck to the surface of the crystal. But if, it, if this fluid were water, say, it would get stuck to the surface of the crystal. So when the crystal moves, the, 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 the fluid would move with the crystal and therefore increase the mass of the crystal and therefore reduce the resonant frequency. And so 
this picture, oops, right. so, so you'd expect that the reduction in the resonant frequency, which is the vertical axis, um, goes, would simply increase as you increase the coverage or the amount of stuff absorbed on the, on the surface of the crystal, and this uh, peculiar quantity on the, on the horizontal axis, it basically is proportional to the amount of uh, fluid absorbed onto the crystal. Basically, it you know, depends on the pressure. And the, ex the, the straight line is the expected behavior. You know, if the fluid was stuck to the surface of the crystal and vibrated with the crystal, then the resonant frequency would follow the straight line. As a function of the, uh, the, as a function of the pressure, of the of the gas being absorbed in the crystal. But, and so for small coverages, it, it follows exactly the expected line. That's uh, you know the, the start of the curve. It seems to follow this straight line very well. But then, at a higher coverage. Um, it certainly suddenly deviates from the, from the expected straight line. And there's this big, um, sorry, this thing is this laser pointer. No, nope. try and press the various buttons. Oops. Now I switch it off. How the hell do you switch this? Oh, ah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this discrepancy between the expected line here and the actual, thank you, and the actual experimental line. Let's see this thing. Of course, I can't get this thing to work. I'm very technical. Oh, 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 hold me the wrong way. And so on, a bit technologically challenged, you see, right. There we go. This discrepancy between the expected line and the experimental line represents the amount of fluid which is some decoupled from the crystal. In other words, the crystal is vibrating, but mo some of the fluid is simply not moving with the crystal. And the, the, the most naive interpretation of this is that, is that some of the fluid has gone what we call superfluid. In other words, something is decoupled from the, from, the, from the substrate. Now, the superfluid does its own thing. Um, but also, this seemed to, conf remember, this seemed to conflict with the, 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 um, this rigorous theorem of Merman Wagner, which says that such a, in such a system, there's no long range order at any finite temperature, plus the laws laid down for us by Lev Landau. And so this um, discrepancy, as um, is shown by this very clearly by this experiment, needed some explanation. Now, David outlined to me the reasons why I was puzzled and, we w and wondered if by reading the literature and exploring further, I could find out how this contra contradiction could be resolved. After, and after some months of thinking and discussions with David, I took my results to him and said, and he said, oh, we're on to something, let's continue. And this work resulted in uh, the, 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 the theory which formed the basis for our Nobel Prize, which I think is not bad for a, a guy of only 31 doing his first ever problem in condensed matter physics. Now, I've got a... Okay. Now, actually all the all the physics can be uh, stated 
in these two little equations in the top right-hand corner. Uh, you see, uh, because So the, yeah, so the, the, the theory okay the, now the, so a th between us we managed to construct a theory, and the crucial predictions of our theory are um, summarized in this this slide here, and basically uh, what it's saying uh, the important thing that it's saying is that the Measured superfluid density. So in, in technical language, it's called the renormalized superfluid density. Uh, renormalized is just, a, it's just a fancy word for measured. And if you take the quantity, you take the superfluid density, measure the superfluid density, mass per unit area, just below the onset temperature divided by the onset temperature, that's the last line, this, is, this ratio is given in terms of a combination of fundamental constants. In other words, 2 and pi and uh, the, Bo the Boltzmann constant, is the K sub B, uh, the mass of the M, the mass of the helium atom, and Planck, in the denominator, you've got a pi, and you've got h bar squared. h bar is Planck's constant. And this combination is precisely uh, that number, 3.491 times, I think it's 10 to the minus 9. I think I've got it, the 10 to the minus 8 is a, mis is a, is a, me is a mess up. It should, be, it should be 10 to the minus 9 grams per square centimeter per degree Kelvin. Now. The theory results in this number, and this number is inescapable. I mean, there's no way, no modification of the theory can change this number, which uh, is a bit surprising, but uh, it's the re results of the theory we used. So, so the well, the theory, is, the theory says that, okay, so this quantity, the superfluid density, if you're below the critical temperature, this is equal to this combination on the, oops, I'm somewhat technologically challenged here. What's that? Oh, there we go, right. Ah. <laughs> this combination here, if you're, below, if you're below, below the onset, if your temperature low enough, below the onset temperature, this combination here can be computed as two over pi plus some constant, which is difficult to calculate, times the square root of the distance you are below the critical temperature. That's for T if you're below the critical temperature. Right at the critical temperature, this ratio becomes this number, inescapable number, and above the critical temperature, this quantity drops to zero. So that's the prediction of a, th of a theory. And the question is, I mean, that's a real smoking gun prediction. I mean, in the sense that if experiment gets a different number, the whole theory is dead and you're back to the drawing board. Okay, now. Well, it's interesting to note that the papers uh, which, which, which David and I wrote on this problem were actually published in a very uh, low-impact journal, uh, just the, you know, the British Journal of Physics. I don't know what its impact uh, factor is, but it's not high. And so 
the, the, these th first th three papers um, are basically in a summary of the work for which David and I won the, won, got our share of the Nobel Prize. Now, the, 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 this, the 2016 Nobel Prize is quite interesting because it was shared between, it was shared between two pieces of work. There was one, and there's two people involved in each piece of work, which makes a total of four. Unfortunately, the Nobel Committee Foundation has an upper limit on the number of people who can share a prize, and their upper limit is three. But in this particular case, but here the, the problem is now you've got three people, maximum of three, but four people involved, but fortunately, Two of the people, one of the, one of the members of each, piece of each piece of work was the same person, David Fowlis. So the money was uh, split. Uh, I, got a th I got a quarter of the prize, Fowlis got a half the prize, and Haldane got a quarter, which is, um, you know, exactly the right split between, because it had to be divided equally among four people. But two of the people were the same person, so. Uh, that, I mean, when I first heard about this, well, because I was incredibly flattered to be um, to learn that I've been awarded the Nobel Prize, but I got a bit, little bit, at first, mildly upset when I heard about the division of the money. Because I thought, oh, that's not fair; it should be a third each. But then, on thinking about it a bit, I realised that the Nobel Committee had been much smarter, was much smarter than I was. And they were very, very fair. Um, and the, the division of money was actually you know, done, done extremely well. Now, I'm just about finished. So, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Here's the, a picture of um, the uh, verification of theory because the, 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 the various points are a, a compilation of experiments on uh, superfluidity in, two in thin films uh, done by various people. Uh, it was Bishop and Reppy, uh, Bob Halleck, Michelle, and Rudnick. And there, so we're plotting the superfluid density, the mass, mass unit area of superfluid just below TC, times 10 to the 9, uh, so my, my 10, to the eight was, 10 to the minus 8 was wrong, against the, the actual critical temperature. Now, because you may ask the question, how do, you, how do you change the critical temperature of the system? Well, it's actually very easy, uh, because all you have to do is make the film a little bit thicker, and then you, the, the critical temperature will, will increase. And so, the first thing was plotted with this set of points. And there was the, 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 the authors, Bishop and Rappi, were staring at this, um, wondering what they should, you know, what they could say about the, these points. And then somebody else said, oh, these two guys from Britain, um, Costa and Thales, had a theory. Oh, sorry, I should point out that also David Nelson was an important player here because he and I actually made the, made the actual prediction um, of the, of, for the ratio of the superfluid density to the critical temperature. Um, but in any event, somebody said, but, these, but there's a theory. And the theory simply predicts the slope of that, of that, of the, it says that the superfluid density, density just below the critical temperature, temperature is actually proportional to the cr critical temperature, and the proportionality constant has been calculated. And so you, you and so that's a solid line. That's the theory. So the because uh, being biased. I would say that this, this picture basically provides confirmation of a theory. 
you can argue that the, look, the, the, the points are scattered all, all over the place and the, you know, the, half of them are miles from the, from the straight line and so on and so forth. But uh, as a biased um, observer, I would say that the agreement between theory and experiment is pretty good. Now, okay, the, the reason why, so I no, haven't mentioned why this, um, this problem is connected with topology. And of course, the reason is that the whole um, theory depends on the, some of the, the, pro, the, the so-called vortex excitations in, 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 in the helium film. Now, the, the thing is that these vortex excitations, uh, you in order to, so if you start with a, with, a, with a superfluid film, and you want to turn the superfluid film into a normal fluid, which you know is gonna happen as you increase the temperature. The difference between a superfluid film and a normal fluid is that if you uh, impose a flow pattern on the fluid, then a superfluid will f is, is, is metastable. In other words, the, the fluid will continue flowing with no dissipation. Whereas a normal fluid is a standard dissipative uh, system where the, you know, once it, you, the, as soon as you stop driving the flow, it will stop. And the question is what Actually, what excitation, suppose you start from a superfluid, what excitations in the superfluid can reduce the velocity of the flow? And the answer is, you produce these um, configurations called vortices. Now, most of you have probably seen a vortex, or at least those of you who've had, who are in the habit of taking baths, <laughs> when you pull the plug out of the, of the drain hole, the, the, flow, the water will flow down the drain, you know, by circling round and round, and that's a vortex. So you've all probably, most of you have seen vortices. And these excitations are certainly possible. And one goes by the, 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 the standard way of treating these things by, by statistical mechanics. And statistical mechanics says that the probability of a particular excitation is proportional to the, ex the you, you calculate the energy, multiply it one over kT, put a minus sign in front of it, and, and put it in an exponential, and that gives you a probability of, find of such an excitation being produced. In other words, statistical mechanics says anything that can happen will happen with some probability. Now. Now the only thing that can spoil a superfluid flow is are these vortices. Now the, the normal the low energy fluctuations don't do anything. No. But these very improbable excitations can reduce the superfluid velocity by simply a pair of vortices, a vortex, anti-vortex pair can be created, uh, and then it basically will move perpendicular to the superfluid flow, which is this direction, and when the, this pair either hits the edges and disappears or goes round the system and, and annihilates that, if you had periodic boundary conditions, that process, every time that process happens, you will reduce the superfluid flow by a small amount the superfluid velocity by a small amount. But since this process can happen over and over again, assuming that there are, there are these vor vor vortex, anti-vortex pairs around, then this dissipation will happen. So these vortices are central to, the, to distinguishing between a normal fluid and a superfluid, because a, a superfluid is a fluid with uh, vortex, anti-vortex pairs which are closely bound. 
just as they look like local defects. A normal fluid, on the other hand, would be one where the, the, these vortices and anti-vortices are basically free and can move around freely, so when you pose a flow, they'll just um, move and go to the edges or if you've got periodic boundary conditions on, go around the back of the tube and annihilate. And this will, this uh, mechanism will reduce the flow, the superfluid velocity. And so that is, so in other words, the difference between a normal fluid and a superfluid is that a normal fluid would have a bunch, you know, these vortices and anti-vortices would be basically free and can can move freely, whereas the superfluid would be bound to get bound in pairs, or at least there'd be, uh, uh, there'd be no free vortices or free anti-vortices. And so this is the, the this is basically the, the theory that uh, Dave and I produced. And we published three papers on the problem, but in 1972 to 74, but actually didn't get any citations for several years. We weren't bothered by this because we regarded the work as, a, as an intellectual exercise on a purely theoretical problem. I published a few more papers on the topic and then David left Birmingham in 1977 for the USA and I stayed from 1982 when I joined Brown University. Now, As I said, the experiment by Repi, uh, Bishop and Repi, confirmed our, uh, our theory in amazing detail. And this is something that doesn't happen very often in physics and caused quite a stir. Suddenly, we found a paper was, pub was cited um, up to 200 times a week, and a whole new field of physics grew up with by now, many thousands of papers published with our ideas of topological defect-driven uh, transitions as the basis. And between 1999 and 2007, experiments on melting were carried out, melting of two-dimensional crystals were carried out by Georges Marais at, and company in France, further confirming the theory of defect-driven phase transitions in two dimensions. Now, in fact, um, so this, this last slide basically, sorry, going the wrong way. Okay, there's the last, there is a picture, a graph of <coughs> campaigning theory and experiment for two-dimensional melting. Now, the the two-dimensional melting process is also carried out by, due to topological excitations, and these topological excitations in a, in a, <clears throat> in a crystal are dislocations. I, 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 won't, I don't have time to talk about those, so I'm really running out of time. Now, the, this, 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 um, the, the, the prediction the theoretical prediction says that an, an experiment with the measured quantity in, in the two-dimensional crystal, this experimental quantity is called the Young's modulus, which is well known from elasticity theory. That this combination of elastic constants um, has got a large, uh, below the melting temperature, it's got a large value and as you approach the melting temperature, falls abruptly to its, um, uh, to its predicted value. And the theoretical prediction using, these, using, this, using this theory of dislocations is six, exactly 16 pi, this particular combination of elastic constants in, in a triangular lattice. And the comparison with the theory experiment is illustrated in this graph, which is taken from a paper by um, Zhang Galini et al. of 2005 in, in the journal Physics, 
uh, condensed matter, as the reference on the, on the top of the slide. The, uh, the points with large error bars are the experimental points. The, 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 the solid line, uh, which go, goes down and then suddenly plunges to this uh, special value, There we go. No, never mind. So it goes, it plunges to the, the predicted value of 16 pi at the melting temperature. The, uh, the points without error bars are points obtained by numerical simulation of the theory, which, and this theory is based on pure, elastic, pure elasticity theory. And so one could, one could argue that this is also a good confirmation of the theory of um, melting by these so-called topological defects, otherwise known as dislocations. But at least the theory and experiment seem to agree pretty well as well as, the, as, well as can be expected. So that's basically everything I have to say, oh, it's also been applied to um, two-dimensional optical lattices. Uh, the paper uh, is pu was published in Nature in 2006 by uh, Hadzababek and, and uh, basically by the Dalabar group in, in France. And so, I think I'll con better conclude here because I'm running over time. I'd like to thank David Thalnes for introducing me to this beautiful problem, David Nelson for collaboration and discussions, John Reppy for many useful discussions, and the Nobel Committee for the recognition. I also wish to thank my wife, Barrett, for an incredible life journey, taking us from uh, actually Cambridge to Oxford, to Birmingham, to Providence, and finally, but not least, my children, Con, Jonathan, and Elizabeth, for putting up with, her, with me, uh, putting up with a rather strange father. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>
a number of my very good friends have been killed on the big mountains. So my own personal achievement was probably doing uh, a very early ascent of the American route on the, way, on, on the Aigui de Dreux in the French Alps, which was an interesting uh, experience because we were stuck in that, we spent two days climbing the hard part and then uh, had to spend the night on a ledge during which, during, during the night, uh, we met a couple of French climbers who'd come up the ordinary route and then the weather, all the weather went to hell. And the most god awful storm hit. And um, after some discussion about how we're going to get down, the two French lads said, uh, whatever you do, we'll come with you. And so we decided to go straight down the way we'd come up, which was steep, but um, at least it was straight. And so we spent the next few hours sliding down ropes and, and eventually uh, got, got down onto the, uh, um, on, on, onto the wo sort of walking ground. And we had a sort of a 50 meters or, you know, 50 to 100 yards of steep snow to cross. And uh, everybody got across safely except for one French guy who slipped and went sliding down the snow slope. And uh, I looked, I looked at Mick Burke and we looked at each other and said, uh, he's going to get hurt and we're going to have a problem. And sure enough, he vanished into the, um, the, you know, the crevasse which uh, at the bottom of the snow slope. And so Mick and I looked at each other and said, I said, well, why don't we just leave him there? He'll be all right. <laughs> um, we, were a bit, we, were, we were soaked through. Um, you know, didn't have, a, didn't have any dry stitch of clothing on us because at the last descent, we had to abseil or slide down the rope from uh, a slab which ended up undercut and had to go straight down the rope. And of course, it was storming. And at low down, the snow was melting, so the water followed the path of least resistance, which was straight down a rope. And so we were soaked, soaked to the skin. And the idea of spending another night out was very unattractive because we knew that as soon as the weather cleared, which was going to do fairly soon, the temperature would plunge. Uh, so, but eventually our conscious, our, uh, we, we thought, you really can't leave them there. We better get them out. So we, Mick went down the rope and uh, we dragged him out and he had a smashed leg. And so uh, we sort of hauled him up the slope to the place where we'd spent the night uh, before, before the climb, which was on a little cave under a boulder. And so we spent the night there when the weather cleared and the temperature plunged, soaked to the skin, uh, without, a, without any dry clothing at all, uh, in, sub, in freezing temperatures, with this guy who'd broken his leg. And so we had to stay with him. Um, and during the night, the rescue party came up and, and they sort of loaded him onto the stretcher and, and they asked us, do we want to come with them or what? So Mick and I decided that um, we were so uh, frozen, you know, so cold and frozen and tired that walking back down in the dark, we'd probably kill it, we'd probably hurt ourselves. So we decided that we'd just sit it out. Um, and so that is probably the most dramatic uh, episode in my climbing career. Um, and to tell the truth, it was uh, um, more than more than really I could take. <laughs> All right, one final question from somebody. That's your final chance to ask a question. Yes, please. Uh, uh, use the microphone. I'm very loud, Fine. so it doesn't matter. <laughs> For those of us who will never get any closer to the Nobel Prize than talking to you right now, uh, could you? 
give us a little of the feelings of how you found out, were you expecting it, and then the process of going through, going and getting it. I just, mm -hmm. It seems so fascinating. Okay, well, uh, I found out when I was, I was actually on sabbatical in Finland, and we were in an underground car park in a small town um, not so far from Helsinki, waiting to go up to the mall for a, su a sushi lunch and beer. When my, my cell phone went off, and my pocket went off. So I hauled out of my jeans pocket, which was quite difficult, and answered it. And this, this Swedish accent came over uh, the, the Royal Academy of Sciences in Sweden, blah, 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 Nobel Prize. And you know, at this point, I was, so, I was absolutely astonished because the work, you know, the best piece of work uh, I'd ever done was this staff which I'd done with David back in the early 70s. Uh, and we knew that was a good piece of work and it had been cited, you know, uh, can't, don't know, about six, 7,000 times by, by, the, by that point. But I was still pretty surprised because I'd given up any idea of a major prize for that work because there'd been some move in the mid 80s for the, to, for the Nobel Prize, but nothing came of it. So I just assumed that it would never happen. So I'd just gone out of my mind. And so when this phone call came, I was, and, and, and I was told I'd won the Nobel Prize, I was so astonished that I was sort of sit, sit, sitting there in the back seat of this car in the underground car park going, trying to think of something to say. And I've since heard a recording of this episode. So it was a, basically a stunned silence for about 30 seconds. And then there was a soft uh, expletive, Jesus. <laughs> and so, because I, I was so surprised. I couldn't, be, I couldn't believe it. Um, and, okay, so then, the next thing that happened was I uh, had, to, had to get some, 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 some decent clothes because the Nobel ceremony is a little bit on the formal side. And so the first thing I had to get, get, go, go out and buy was a, you know, a black suit, black suit, uh, and, uh, the informal dress for the Nobel ceremonies. Um, so and he bought myself all sorts of some new clothes and so on. And then, next thing that happened was that got this invitation. But then, so I was on sabbatical, as I said. So my time in, in, in Finland was up, and then we went to Korea. Then, the ne then came this invitation to visit the White House. You know, because, you know, go shake a, a President Obama's hand and so on. So we thought that, that, and that was for the week before the Nobel Prize. So we thought that would be nice. But the question was, who's going to pay for the ticket, the air ticket for me and my wife from Korea to Washington to, to Stockholm and then back to Korea? Um, so we, I negotiated with the Nobel Committee, and they agreed that yes, they'd pay for our, our round-the-world tickets, provided they would be cheaper than a round trip from, uh, from Providence to Stockholm. So we priced it out, and lo and behold, it was cheaper <laughs> to, to, to do, go around the world once. And apparently the reason for this is because the main source of income for the airlines is a transatlantic trip. So going from my home institution to Stockholm and back would involve crossing the Atlantic twice, and therefore was more expensive than going around the world once. <laughs> that's topology. Yeah, that's topology for you. <laughs> right. And so, okay, so then the Nobel ceremonies were, were pretty interesting because we were assigned a personal attache who was a charming young lady who 
made sure that we were in the right place at the right time, dressed in the right clothes. Um, and we're also, we're also assigned a car and driver. Car is hardly the right word, it's more limousine and driver. Which, and this limousine would take us anywhere we wanted to go at any time. Uh, of course, we had to, had to rent um, you know, the full monkey suit, you know, the tails and Sorry. yeah, white bow tie and all the rest of it. And there was also a chance to buy some decent clothes because I'm more a t-shirt and jeans sort of character than the, uh, the tails and bow tie uh, type. So uh, it was interesting because the this we start, started yeah right with a whole week of cel of, uh, of of celebrations S and uh, I, I, every hour of every day was choreographed and so you know the attaché would appear at our hotel at eight in the morning or something and we were given instructions, what to do, where to go, and so on and so forth. So I basically went into my performing dog mode for the rest of the week and simply did what I was told, you know. If I was told to roll over, I'd roll over. If I was told to bark, I'd bark, and so on. Um, and it was, it was a pretty intense week with, with the things happening every hour of every day, and in particular, there was the Nobel ceremony itself, um, followed by a very formal banquet. And I, had, I was uh, told that, uh, okay, I had to escort the Crown Princess of Sweden to, this, to dinner, to this banquet. And escorting the Crown Princess involved walking down a set of stairs from high up in the, in the concert hall and down some stone steps uh, and then to the to, to, to the to the to the table. Now, my my balance because of this neurological illness of mine, my balance is not the best, and so I was a bit terrified of when walking down these long flight of stone steps with the crown princess on my arm. I was terrified of falling and dragging her down with me because that would have been quite something. <laughs> in some sort of international incident. But fortunately, she's a big, strong girl, girl and she could hold me up. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it, was, it was interesting because this banquet, oh yeah, the Nobel ceremony itself, the presentation, you're on the stage in this, uh, in this concert hall. Um, with the, the royal family at the other side of the stage. And when you were uh, announced, you had to get up and go to some spot. Then you had to basically receive your, um, the, your prize from the king. Then the protocol was you bow to the king Bow. Then you bow to the, uh, the the Nobel Committee, who was also seated on the stage, and then bow to the crowd, bow to the audience. Unfortunately, this involved turning left first, right? because uh, you know it's, it's a bow to the king who was standing there. Then the Nobel Committee was seated over there, so I should have turned that way and then spun 180 degrees and bowed to the audience. But of course, my natural instincts took over at this point, and I went the wrong, turned the wrong way and went, bowed to the audience first. And then, when I was just doing that, I thought, oh, I should, should have bowed to the Nobel Committee. Who was <laughs> so that was, I was a little, bit, a little bit embarrassed by that. And of course, no tickets, no tickets. No, no, there's no, 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 there was no, 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 cit no um, citation from the police for that, but, uh, it was embarrassing. And so 
I thought, you know, I thought that this uh, uh, ceremony was so simple that only an idiot could possibly screw it up. <laughs> but I managed. <laughs> With that, let's thank Professor Kessler. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs>